Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is loaded synchronous generators. Our objective is to examine electrically excited synchronous generators in the loaded condition. We'll explore how varying the magnitude and reactive nature of the electrical load connected to a synchronous generator can influence the generator's output and how operators can compensate for these disturbances. This lecture is limited in scope to loaded synchronous generators in isolated conditions and does not discuss generator synchronization. We'll explore generator synchronization in greater detail in later lectures. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers watch the unloaded electrically excited synchronous generators lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only dimly recall its contents, please bring yourself up to speed and return when you are so qualified. In the aforementioned lecture, we examine electrically excited synchronous generators in the unloaded condition. We learned that physical construction of the stator windings influence phase shift, rotational direction of the prime mover influences phase sequence, field current strength influences voltage magnitude, and prime mover rotational speed influences both frequency and voltage magnitude. For the purposes of the aforementioned lecture, we assume the generator was isolated and not supplying any electrical load. An analogy might be installing and setting up the first generator on some small island community with no other generation facilities nor any electrical grid. Before we start supplying electricity to the grass huts, coconut farms, and fish processing facilities on this island, it's probably a good idea to establish a desired phase sequence, phase shift, frequency, and magnitude before doing so. We did so in the previous lecture by varying prime mover rotational speed, direction, and field current to achieve the desired specification. It's time to put this generator to work. In a perfect world, a perfect generator wouldn't be perturbed in the slightest by an electrical load and output voltage will remain at the voltage magnitude and frequency no matter the magnitude of the electrical load nor its reactive nature. In the real world, electrical demand can and does influence voltage output largely because the stator windings of a real world electrical device are not ideal in nature but rather full of non-ideal junk and non-linearities that needs to be accounted for. Now I could go ahead and be all fancy and properly model the stator windings of the generator using the Steinmetz equivalent circuit and account for stator resistance, stator leakage reactance, rotor resistance, rotor leakage reactance, slip and magnetizing reactance, but ain't nobody got time for that. If you want this lecture done in this lifetime, let's use this far simpler equivalent circuit. Each stator winding can be modeled as a voltage source in series with a small resistance value in series with a comparatively larger inductive reactance. The voltage source is the electromotive force produced by the generator when it's consuming the mechanical power of the prime mover. Thus far, we haven't output any electrical power, but this is where it's coming from. The small resistance value internal to the windings accounts for the real-world resistance of the coil of the wire constituting the stator winding. The comparatively larger inductive reactance value internal to the winding accounts for the inductive nature of the stator winding. An important distinction needs to be made between the electromotive force produced by the generator and the output voltage at the stator terminals. For the purposes of this simplification, let's consider just one winding of a Y-connected three-phase stator, and you're just going to have to imagine that everything is occurring in the remaining two phases with a 120-degree phase shift. Let's assume the internal stator resistive component has a magnitude of 5 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees, and the internal stator inductive component has a magnitude of 20 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. In the previous lecture, we established 120 volts line to neutral, 208 volts line to line, 60 hertz, three phase AC. In the unloaded condition, no current flows through the internal stator resistance and inductive components, and no voltage is dropped across these components. Thus, all electromotive force voltage appears at the stator output terminals. This is essentially an open circuit scenario where all electromotive voltage appears across the terminals of an open switch. In the unloaded condition, this is the one scenario in which a generator output at the terminals of the stator is equal to the generator electromotive force, principally because with no current flowing through the non-ideal internal stator components, there is no voltage across these elements, thus no losses. In this example, in the unloaded condition, we would observe an output line to neutral voltage of 120 volts, i.e. the generator electromotive force without any losses. In the loaded condition, however, current does flow through the non-ideal internal stator resistive and inductive reactance components, thus these elements experience voltage drops, such that the output voltage at the terminals of the stator is different from generator electromotive force. 
It's perhaps easiest to demonstrate these effects of these non-ideal elements with a series of illustrated calculations. Follow along if you're up to the task. We've got three scenarios to discuss, resistive, inductive, and capacitive loads. This portion of the lecture presumes the viewer is familiar with series AC circuit analysis using phasor equivalents. If you're a little shaky on this subject, by all means revisit the series AC circuit analysis lecture at the Big Bad Tech channel, return when you're so qualified. Let's deal with resistive loads first. Let's first assume the electrical load in question is purely resistive in nature with a value of 1000 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Output voltage at the terminals of the stator is therefore voltage across the purely resistive electrical load elements. Taken in series, the inductive and resistive components internal to the stator and the purely resistive electrical load represent a total of beams of 1105.2 ohms at an angle of 1.1 degrees. An application of AC Ohm's law demonstrates 119.4 milliampers at an angle of negative 1.1 degrees of current flows through all three series components. Subsequent applications of AC Ohm's law demonstrates the non-ideal resistive component in terms of the state or winding experiences a voltage drop of 0.6 volts at an angle of negative 1.1 degrees. The inductive component in terms of the state or winding experiences a voltage drop of 2.4 volts at an angle of 88.9 degrees such that the purely resistive electrical load experiences the remaining 119.4 volts at an angle of negative 1.1 degrees. Concerning ourselves solely with the magnitude in the slightly loaded condition, output voltage dropped from a theoretically possible 120 volts to a reduced real-world value of 119.4 volts. This is to be expected given all the junk in series with the purely resistive electrical load. Now let's see what happens when we decrease the magnitude of the resistive electrical load to 100 ohms at an angle of zero degrees and draw more current. Stands to conjecture more current through the non-ideal internal stator components will result in more of a voltage drop across them, thus less output voltage at the electrical load. Let's see if this is the case. We could perform the exact same lengthy series AC circuit analysis making use of AC Ohm's law as previously or efficiently and directly arrive at the same result using the AC voltage divider rule. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates the purely resistive electrical load experiences a reduced output voltage of 112.3 volts at an angle of negative 1.1 degrees. These calculations demonstrate a phenomenon observable in real life, that phenomenon being increased current drawn by external resistive loads results in an increased voltage reduction at the output terminals. A graph of output voltage as a function of load current for resistive loads might look something like this. In the unloaded condition, i.e. no current, output voltage was the ideal 120 volts we initially established. When we connected a 1000 ohm resistive load and draw just a little bit of current, output voltage dropped to 119.4 volts. When we connected a 100 ohm resistive load, Load current increased and output voltage dropped to 112.3 volts. Long story short, increased current demand for resistive loads results in a reduction of output voltage. Let's now do the same thing for inductive loads. We should observe a similar phenomenon, although slightly more dramatic in nature. This time, let's assume the electrical load in question is purely inductive in nature with a value of 1000 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. Output voltage at the terminals of the stator is again the voltage across the purely inductive electrical load. As previously, let's jump right to the answer of the quick application of the AC voltage divider rule. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates the purely inductive electrical load experiences a reduced output voltage of 117.6 volts at an angle of 0.3 degrees. Notice the drop for the inductive load is a little bit more pronounced than it was for the resistive load, even with a similar magnitude. Let's see what happens when we decrease the magnitude of the inductive electrical load to 100 ohms at an angle of positive 90 degrees and draw more current. Another application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates the purely inductive electrical load now experiences a reduced output voltage of 99.9 volts at an angle of 2.4 degrees. Again, notice the drop in output voltage for the inductive load is a little bit more pronounced than it was for the resistive load of the same magnitude. These calculations demonstrate a phenomenon observable in real life. That phenomenon being increased current drawn by inductive loads results in increased voltage reduction at the output. A graph of output voltage as a function of load current for inductive loads might look something like this. In the unloaded condition, i.e. no current, output voltage was the ideal 120 volts we initially established. When we connected a 1000 ohm inductive load and drew a little current, 
output voltage dropped to 117.6 volts. When we connected a smaller 100 ohm inductive load, current increased and output voltage dropped to 99.5 volts. Similar to resistive loads, increased current demand for inductive loads results in a reduction of output voltage, only it's more pronounced. Let's do the same thing for capacitive loads. The viewer may initially suspect similar behavior as we observe for resistive and inductive loads. However, I should remind you that capacitive and inductive elements are essentially polar opposites of one another, can counteract one another. For this reason, pay attention to a rather surprising phenomenon. Let's assume the electrical load in question is purely capacitive in nature with a value of 1000 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Output voltage at the terminals of the stator is again the voltage across the external purely capacitive electrical load. As previously, let's jump right to an answer with a quick application of the AC voltage divider rule. The AC voltage divider rule demonstrates the purely capacitive electrical load experiences an increased output voltage of 122.4 volts at an angle of negative 0.3 degrees. This is entirely opposite of the effects we observed with resistive and inductive loads, yet entirely to be expected. Note the inductive nonlinearity internal to the stator windings and the capacitive electrical load essentially work against each other, so the load experiences a higher output voltage drop. Let's see what happens when we decrease the magnitude of the capacitive electrical load to 100 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Another application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates that purely capacitive electrical load now experiences a further increased output voltage of 149.7 volts at an angle of negative 3.6 degrees. These calculations demonstrate a phenomenon observable in real life, that phenomenon being capacitive loads experience increased output voltage. A graph of output voltage as a function of load current for capacitive loads might look something like this. In the unloaded condition, i.e. no current, Output voltage was the ideal 120 volts we initially established. When we connected a 1000 ohm capacitive load, output voltage rose to 122.4 volts. When we connected a 100 ohm capacitive load, output voltage increased to 149.7 volts. In contrast to resistive and inductive loads, increased current demand for capacitive loads results in increased output voltage. This collection of curves illustrates the voltage regulation characteristics of a synchronous generator experienced for a range of loaded conditions. In summary, resistive loads experience a reduction in output voltage as current demand increases. Inductive loads experience a similar reduction effect, only more pronounced. Capacitive loads, in contrast, experience increased output voltage. Given these observations about voltage regulation for loaded synchronous generators, viewers might be asking a pertinent question. That question being, how does one compensate for these undesirable effects? After all, residential electrical users can expect to experience a stable line voltage in the unloaded condition and the loaded condition, whether that load is an air fryer, a hair dryer, a refrigerator, freezer, or a fan. Only in the rarest and suckiest of circumstances does a residential power user experience a load-dependent voltage drop. The voltage stability exhibited by a modern day power distribution system doesn't happen by magic, but rather takes active management by generator operators and sophisticated control systems. Operators and control systems continuously monitor output and adjust generator input so voltage remains at some desired fixed value. Think back to the input properties of synchronous generators. If you recall, the physical construction of the stator windings influences phase shift. The rotational direction of the prime mover influences phase sequence, field current strength influences voltage magnitude, and prime mover rotational speed influences both frequency and voltage magnitude. If you had a choice, which of these properties could be most easily varied to compensate for the voltage magnitude fluctuations we experience in different load conditions? If you said field current, you're right, principally because field current magnitude affects resultant voltage magnitude and voltage magnitude only. Prime mover rotational speed also affects voltage magnitude, but it also affects frequency. If we change rotational speed, we would affect voltage magnitude, but we'd also affect frequency. This isn't ideal since we want fixed voltage magnitude and fixed frequency. Spoiler alert, we're going to be discussing frequency before we bring this lecture to a close. Right now, we're zooming in on voltage. Consider our previous theoretical model of a synchronous generator with both resistive and inductive impedance components internal to the stator windings. In an unloaded condition, the line of neutral voltage value was 120 volts. 
when we connected a 1000 ohm resistive load, output voltage slightly dropped to 119.4 volts. Given this reduced voltage magnitude in this lightly loaded state, a super easy solution to this scenario might be to keep the prime mover rotating in the same direction at the same speed, yet slightly increase field current such that output voltage rises back to the desired 120 volts. Similarly, when we connected a smaller 100 ohm resistive load, output voltage dropped to 112.3 volts. Given this notably reduced voltage in this increasingly loaded state, an operator would again keep the prime mover rotating in the same direction at the same speed, yet increase field current again, such that the output voltage rises back to the desired 120 volts. Similarly, to maintain output voltage at predict fixed values given varying inductive loads, one would anticipate operators progressively increasing field current as inductive demand increases. If you want to think of it this way, given the downward sloping voltage regulation curves of resistive and inductive loads, an operator is essentially trying to bend them back up to the fixed value by progressively increasing field current. The one difference being inductive loads necessitate a little bit more corrective action in the form of more field current since they exhibit a steeper negative slope than resistors. Capacitive loads, in contrast, necessitate an entirely opposite approach. To maintain output voltage at a predictable fixed value given varying fixed capacitive loads, one would anticipate operators progressively decreasing field current. As previously, one might think of an operator trying to bend the upward sloping voltage regulation curve of capacitive loads back down to the fixed value by progressively decreasing field current. Keep in mind, compensating for a load scenario isn't set it and forget it, but rather necessitates continual monitoring or adjustment given loads can and do fluctuate, sometimes wildly, with no discernible pattern. For example, consider a high current demand resistive load where an operator is aggressively compensated for this anticipated reduction in voltage output by increasing field current. Suddenly, the user disconnects that load. At this present level of excitement, one might expect voltage to momentarily surge above the desired fixed value unless the operator decreases the field current in response to this fluctuation in demand. Even more dramatic, consider swapping a high demand inductive load for a high demand capacitive one. A high demand inductive load necessitates substantially increased field current to compensate for the anticipated voltage drop. In contrast, a high demand capacitive load necessitates substantially decreased field current to compensate for the anticipated voltage rise. Switching from one to the other, or worse yet, toggling back and forth between them would understandably result in voltage surges and drops unless the operator or automated system monitoring output voltage and adjusting field current was sufficiently robust and responsive to these events. This is to suggest that monitoring and maintaining a stable grid is not without its challenges and complications. Speaking of complications, let's complicate things. Thus far, we restricted ourselves to discussing voltage magnitude regulation only. If that was all we had to worry about, it'd be great, but it isn't. We also have to worry about load dependent frequency variations. There's a couple ways to discuss frequency regulation, each with their associated degrees of inaccuracy and difficulty. Method one, wave a magic wand and say there is no problem with frequency as a function of electrical load because we are using a super sophisticated constant speed prime mover. If rotational speed remains constant, frequency remains constant, case closed. There is no problem with frequency. It's fanciful as this seems, it's not that far from the truth. Most modern prime movers have some form of speed control, some more sophisticated than others. If the prime mover bogs down, there's some control mechanism in there that speeds it back up. Similarly, if the prime mover overspeeds, there's some control mechanism in there that slows it back down. Think of some automated actuator adjusting the pitch of a turbine blade or a valve regulating the flow of fuel to keep your prime mover subject to a variable oppositional torque at some predetermined constant speed. By keeping prime mover rotational speed constant, you keep frequency constant, case closed. Method two, ignore problems with frequency and say the grid takes care of it. As we'll learn in later lectures on generator synchronization, connecting some small isolated generator to a larger grid kind of does solve a lot of frequency problems, at least for your level of concern. Think about it. Who has more influence over grid frequency? Your rinky dink little three megawatt synchronous generator you run off a piddly steam plant over at the Hicktown toothpick mill or the combined might of the Federal Columbia River power system 
consisting of Bonneville, the Dalles, John Day and McNary Dams in the Lower Columbia, and Ice Harbor, Lower Monumental, Little Goose, and Lower Granite in the Lower Snake River, in total, weighing in an impressive 22,000 megawatts. Even on an off day with half these dams running at half capacity with half the workforce on a half day holiday, these giant concrete juggernauts wouldn't notice your generator in the slightest and would squash you like a bug. One generator has no control over the frequency of the grid when you're connected to and synchronized with the grid. Long story short, ignore it, the grid takes care of it. Which if you're a small generating station, it isn't that far from the truth. If, however, you're a large generating station with an outside influence over the grid, this isn't entirely accurate. Add to this the complexity of frequency oscillations which sometimes occur grid-wide. We're not exploring this possibility in this particular lecture, nor will we in the conceivable future because i got to draw my limits somewhere. And finally, method three, don't ignore the complications, deal with the complications. This necessitates a little bit more effort and thought on your part, but trust me, you'll come away with a better appreciation of the generation process. Follow this chain of thought. As you are no doubt aware, a generator converts rotating mechanical power to electrical power, of which there are two forms, real and reactive power. Reactive power is associated with equal and opposite cyclical exchanges of positive and negative power for capacitive inductive elements. Real power, in contrast, is that portion of electrical power that gets put to work. Our concern is with real power. On a very basic level, Changes in real electrical power output necessitate changes in rotating mechanical power input. Consider a real-world prime mover and generator working in isolation in the unloaded state. Two important observations can be made about this isolated and unloaded state. One, given the generator is working in isolation and not synchronized to any other larger grid, the prime mover rotational speed is the single determining factor of output frequency. Two, given the generator is presently unloaded, no mechanical power is being converted to electrical power, so any oppositional torque experienced by the prime mover is purely to overcome friction. Now, let's put this system to work. We previously assumed the prime mover was this magic device that always maintained a constant speed regardless of what happened, but even the most sophisticated sophisticated closed loop systems necessitate time to detect and time to respond to changes in their operating conditions. Consider what happens the moment an electrical load demanding a copious amount of real electrical power is connected to the generator, i.e. the generator needs to export real electrical power to a load, thus it needs to consume more mechanical power from the prime mover. That idly spinning prime mover is going to slam headfirst into a pool of molasses and can't help but decelerate given it's experiencing increased oppositional torque the moment it gets put to work. This is something the free energy machines you see advertised in the dubious corners of the internet so conveniently neglect. Electrical power doesn't appear by magic, but rather a generator must consume the mechanical power of the prime mover. The more electrical power required, the harder the prime mover has to work. Long story short, the moment a generator experiences an increased demand for real electrical power, the prime mover slows down. What happens when a prime mover slows down? Two things happen. First, obviously, frequency decreases since the rotor electromagnet isn't moving past the stator poles as quickly. Second, not as obviously, voltage magnitude also decreases because induction depends on the rate of change of magnetism. The rotor moving slower, the rate of change of magnetism is slower, thus the voltage magnitude induced at the stator windings is smaller. Now keep in mind, this induction speed related voltage decrease is on top of the voltage decrease already experienced because of the non-ideal elements internal to the stator winding we spent some time discussing earlier in this lecture. In summary, when exporting real electrical power to a load, frequency can decrease because a prime mover experiences oppositional torque and can slow down. Additionally, voltage decreases and decreases again because of the combined effects of reduced rate of change of magnetism and the losses internal to the stator windings. Faced with this less than ideal scenario, an operator or control system has a couple options to bring a generator's output back inside a desired range. Principally, increase the mechanical power of the prime mover to speed it up, and adjust field current. My question to you is this, which one first?
speed, or field current. If you said speed first, you're right. Given the rotational speed of a prime mover influences both frequency and voltage magnitude, it makes sense to resolve frequency issues first, and then when frequency stabilizes, fine-tune voltage magnitude using field current. This way you're not undoing previous corrections. Ideally, an operator should be able to pour enough mechanical power into the prime mover by adjusting the pitch of a turbine blade or opening up a valve so it speeds up to the desired frequency specification and then adjust rotor field current excitation so voltage magnitude reaches an acceptable value. Now this isn't as easy as it sounds. To suggest that an operator control system is gonna hit both targets, frequency and voltage magnitude in the first attempt is somewhat of a reach. The system may adjust speed, then field current, then pending the outcome of this first adjustment, may need to fine tune speed again, then field current again in an iterative approach, ideally each successive adjustment being smaller and smaller in magnitude. Eventually the system should stabilize to meet the needs of that load scenario. Now keep in mind, again, this is not a static load scenario, but can change over time. Consider an occasion where in this compensated state, the electrical load suddenly demands more real electrical power. Again, the prime mover slows down because of increased oppositional torque, and again, the frequency would drop, and voltage magnitude would again decrease due to the combined effects of reduced induction and increased losses internal to windings. Again, the operator would have to further increase mechanical power delivered to the prime mover so it speeds up and frequency stabilizes, then fine-tune field current so voltage magnitude stabilizes. Now, consider what happens to this generator when this high-demand electrical load suddenly disconnects. In this doubly compensated state, the prime mover would suddenly speed up given a sudden loss of oppositional torque and both frequency and voltage magnitude would spike because of the increased rotational speed and high field current. In order to prevent damage to the generation facility and the electric grid, an operator would need to quickly slow the prime mover and decrease field current. This is again to suggest that monitoring and maintaining a stable grid is not without its challenges and complications. For this reason, generation facilities rely on sophisticated automated systems to protect against loss of load, over speeds, under and over voltage, and under and over frequency events. We'll explore these and other mechanisms in greater detail in later lectures on closed loop control systems and protective relays. Until then, let's bring this lecture to a close. In conclusion, we examine synchronous generators in the loaded condition. Learn that the magnitude and reactive nature of an electrical load can influence voltage magnitude. Due to non-ideal components internal to standard windings, both resistive and inductive loads experience output voltage reduction as a function of load current, with this voltage reduction being more pronounced for inductive loads. Capacitive loads, in contrast, experience greater output voltage as a function of load current. Generator operators compensate for these load-induced voltage changes by increasing and decreasing field current to meet the desired voltage specification. We additionally learned that a prime mover lacking a responsive closed loop speed control mechanism can slow down when subjected to high electrical power demand, thus both frequency and voltage decrease. Generator operators compensate for these load induced frequency changes by adjusting prime mover mechanical power to return rotational speed and thus frequency to desired specification, then dial in field current to return voltage magnitude to a desired specification. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.